Good afternoon. Bonjour. Today I'll be sharing the national epidemiology and the modeling work we are using to inform ongoing control of COVID-19 in Canada. But first I'll begin by providing the latest numbers on COVID-19 in Canada. There have now been 106,167 cases reported in Canada to date, including 8,711 deaths. 66% of the cases have now recovered, and labs across Canada have tested over 3,020,000 people for COVID-19 to date. Over the past week, an average of 38,000 people were tested daily, with 1% testing positive. These numbers change quickly and are updated daily in the evenings on canada.ca forward slash coronavirus. Je vais aujourd'hui le, le point sur les travaux scientifiques d'épidémiologie et de modélisation qui guident nos efforts visant à assurer le contrôle continu de la COVID-19 au Canada. Pour commencer, je vais vous présenter les derniers chiffres sur la COVID-19 au Canada. 106 167 cas ont été déclarés au Canada à ce jour, dont 8 711 décès. 66 des cas sont maintenant rétablis. À ce jour, des laboratoires de Parc et d'autres du Canada ont effectué une test de dépistage de la COVID-19 pour plus de 3 millions 20 000 personnes. Au cours de la dernière semaine, nous avons testé en moyenne 38 000 personnes par jour, dont 1 a reçu un résultat positif. Ces chiffres changent rapidement et sont mis à jour quotidiennement en soirée sur le site canada.ca baroblique le trait d'union coronavirus. So moving on to slide two, I'll begin with the update on the latest epidemiology of COVID-19 across Canada. Maintenant, diapositive 3. Bien que la majorité des régions sociosanitaires du Canada ont déclaré des cas de la COVID-19, cette carte, qui représente le taux d'incidence de la maladie pour 100 000, 100 000 personnes, illustre que certaines administrations et régions ont été plus touchées que d'autres. Certaines régions du Québec et de l'Ontario, notamment, ont été particulièrement affectées. Compte tenu de leur grande population, ces provinces représentent 87 des cas. D'autres régions, incluant le nord de la Saskatchewan, ont déclaré un nombre élevé de cas par rapport à la taille de leur population. Si on regarde les boîtes à droite, boîtes en bas concernant les décès, la proportion des décès demeure d'environ 8 ce qui reflète l'impact tragique de la maladie sur les personnes âgées dans des établissements de soins de longue durée. Moving on now to slide four. These graphs showing daily numbers of new cases and deaths illustrate the steady decline in COVID-19 activity since the peak of the epidemic in late April. The small recent increases in cases may be explained by outbreaks and community transmission in Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec. Maintenant, diapositive 5. Nous surveillons également de près le nombre de cas hospitalisés et ceux admis aux soins, santifs, soins intensifs. Ces indicateurs de la sévérité démontrent que nos mesures de santé publique ont réussi à ralentir la transmission de la COVID-19 dans la collectivité, montrant une réduction à la fois du nombre total de cas et du nombre de complications graves. Moving on to slide 6, another indicator of epidemic control is the effective reproduction number, or RT. This number represents how many people are infected by each new case. In order for the epidemic to die out, RT needs to remain consistently below one, meaning on average, each new case infects less than one other person. Nationally, the RT for Canada has been mostly below one for more than 10 weeks, which is good news. However, in recent weeks, the RT has been fluctuating and has sometimes risen above one and also fallen below one. At this point, with transmission largely under control across the country and with cases low in number, the daily RT is likely to fluctuate dramatically. It remains important for us to closely monitor for new cases and outbreaks that, occur, that could arise in any part of the country, even in places which might have few or no cases at the moment. Diapositive set. 
Basé sur les données canadiennes jusqu'au 2 juillet, ce modèle de prévision à court terme a permis de prédire le nombre de cas et des décès reliés à la COVID-19 jusqu'au 17 juillet. De côté gauche, le nombre de cas prévus prévu pourrait se situer entre 106 015 et 111 260 en date du 17 juillet. Du côté droit, le nombre de décès prévus pourrait se situer entre 8 560 et 8 900 en date du 17 juillet. Les lignes en pointillé montrent la trajectoire prévue avec la ligne bleue représentant le nombre de cas que nous anticipons. Puisque la modélisation est une prévision ou une hypothèse informée, les lignes rouges et vertes représentent les limites supérieures et inférieures de cette estimation, qui est fondée sur les prévisions de cas possibles à partir d'un moment donné, le 2 juillet, comme je l'ai mentionné un peu plus tôt. Alors que nous obtenons des données quotidiennement, si nous devions faire une analyse de la prévision aujourd'hui, il est peu probable que la, que la prévision soit très différente de ce que vous voyez sur cette diapositive parce que nous aurions besoin de beaucoup plus de nouvelles données pour qu'il y ait un changement dans la tendance. Toutefois, ce que nous prévoyons est que le nombre réel de cas se situera quelque part entre les lignes rouges et vertes. Nous nous sommes servis de points noirs et rouges pour indiquer ce qui est réellement produit jusqu'à la dernière mise à jour des données. Vous pouvez voir que nous sommes bien dans la trajectoire prévue. La présente diapositive montre la prévision fondée sur un moment donné. Comme le RT, ces prévisions présentent des limites importantes car il est difficile de prédire le nombre national de cas et de décès qui sont désormais largement dus à des éclosions localisées et la transmission communautaire. Moving on to slide 8. The current patterns of COVID-19 infection show limited to no transmission in most areas of the country. The efforts and commitments shown by Canadians across the country over the past months have now shown us that we have been able to impact the pandemic, control transmission nationally, and begin the process of entering the next phase of monitoring and preventing a resurgence. However, we must stay alert and strengthen our response in areas where we continue to have cases in the community and where we have experienced new outbreaks. Areas of increased transmission are shown as darker blue areas on the map. Some of these areas are experiencing localized outbreaks as seen in Alberta and Saskatchewan, while others represent persistent community transmission as seen in and around Toronto and Montreal. Maintenant, diapositive 9. Depuis le début de l'épidémie au Canada, les établissements de soins de longue durée et avec service ont été les plus durement touchés. On compte plus de 1000 éclosions distinctes qui représentent environ 20 des cas confirmés et, tragiquement, plus de 80 des décès. Également, des éclosions ont été déclarées dans des résidences communes et des milieux de travail où il peut être difficile de maintenir une distance physique. Alors que nous relançons progressivement les activités dans la société, nous constatons maintenant des éclosions dans un certain nombre de lieux sociaux, particulièrement dans des espaces avec des contacts étroits, comme les funérailles et les réunions de famille. Moving on to slide 10. Since April, COVID-19 cases have steeply declined in the older population, with the steepest decline seen in those over 80 years of age. This provides some good news that cases are declining among those at risk of the most severe outcomes. Maintenant, diapositive 11. Dans les groupes d'âge les plus jeunes, le nombre total des cas diminue également, mais à une rythme plus lente, en particulier chez les personnes âgées de 20 à 39 ans. Pour continuer à prévenir une résurgence et conserver, conserver la maîtrise de l'épidémie, il faut que les taux de cas d'infection de ces groupes d'âge continue à diminuer de façon constante. Bien que les maladies graves soient moins fréquentes dans les groupes d'âge plus jeunes, les jeunes adultes ne sont pas protégés de conséquences graves. De plus, la transmission dans n'importe quel groupe d'âge constitue un réservoir pour le virus et une menace à notre capacité 
à maintenir le contrôle de l'épidémie. Nous devons nous engager collectivement à prévenir la propagation du virus aux personnes vulnérables de la société, susceptibles de subir des complications graves ou à des milieux où un seul cas pourrait déclencher une épidémie. Slide 12. In summary, the epidemiology indicates that the transmission is largely under control in Canada, while also showing us that cases can reemerge at any time or place. In today's modeling update, I'll review why we need to continue with critical public health measures to maintain control, stamp out outbreaks, and prevent a widespread resurgence of cases. Models provide a prediction of what could happen under hypothetical scenarios, allowing us to drive our public health actions toward a best possible outcome. Diapositive 13. Le Canada vise un contrôle rigoureux de l'épidémie tout au long de, de la pandémie. Notre objectif est que moins de 10 de la population soit infectée. Grâce à l'engagement de la population canadienne qui a suivi les conseils de santé publique pour se protéger et protéger les autres, nous avons atteint la côte descendant de la courbe à la, situ à la suite du premier grand pic. À ce jour, le coronavirus n'a pas été éliminé et nous n'avons pas de vaccin efficace. Alors que certaines mesures restrictives en matière de santé publique sont levées pour minimiser les conséquences sociales, économiques et en matière de santé indésirables, nous nous attendons à observer une résurgence de cas. La meilleure stratégie est de maintenir un petit nombre de cas et de pratiques de santé publique de base. Nous devons être capables de détecter et d'isoler rapidement les cas et de mettre en quarantaine leurs contacts afin de limiter toute résurgence à une taille petite et gérable. Slide 14. Our collective hard work means we have a great impact, have had a great impact on controlling the COVID-19 epidemic across the country. As society reopens, we must continue to strengthen our efforts to prevent a rebound. Public health authorities are continuing to build capacity to rapidly detect new cases and outbreaks as quickly as possible so that action can be taken quickly to prevent future spread. The sooner cases can be identified and isolated in the course of the illness, the fewer other people they might infect. Likewise, when most or all of their contacts are identified early and placed into quarantine, fewer are likely to spread the infection to others if they do become ill. We must also stay vigilant for early signs of a possible increase in cases and continue monitoring indicators that can inform us of changes across the country. Diapositive Keynes. Maintenant qu'il y a moins de cas de la COVID-19, nous devons nous assurer que nous savons comment les personnes ont été infectées ou comment elles sont liées à un autre cas ou à une autre source que nous pouvons identifier. Les barres rouges de ce graphique indiquent les cas sans source d'exposition connue. La proportion de ces cas a diminué au fil du temps grâce à l'efficacité de nos mesures de santé publique. Plus il y a de cas pour lesquels nous ignorons la source d'infection, plus il est difficile d'éviter une augmentation des cas. Now moving on to slide 16. These dynamic models all tell us that if we relax too much or too soon, the epidemic will most likely rebound with explosive growth as a distinct possibility. Modeling simulations show us that as we lift stay-at-home policies and business and school closures indicated by the green bar, we risk the epidemic potentially resurging later in the summer and into the fall if we do not strengthen other public health measures to maintain epidemic control. The enhanced public health measures include rapid case detection and timely contact tracing and quarantine to prevent new introductions control any new chains of transmission and outbreak or community settings. This possibility of significant resurgence is not just hypothetical, as this is exactly what we are already seeing in some other parts of the world. Et finalement, diapositive 17. Le Canada a réalisé d'importants progrès pour arriver à maîtriser l'épidémie, notamment grâce à l'engagement des Canadiens à respecter les pratiques de santé publique pour se protéger et protéger les autres. Dans l'ensemble du pays, les provinces et les territoires continuent d'accroître 
des activités sociales et économiques en mettant en, mettre en place des conditions et des mesures de contrôle appropriées pour réduire au minimum la propagation du virus. Toutefois, le virus n'est pas disparu. Il pourrait y avoir une résurgence à tout moment et en tout lieu. D'ici à ce qu'un vaccin ou qu'un tra qu traitement efficace soit disponible, nous devons continuer à vivre avec la COVID-19 en trouvant un équilibre entre les risques associés à la propagation de la COVID-19 et les conséquences sociales et sanitaires inattendues des mesures restrictives en matière de santé publique. Dans le cas d'un résultat positif à un test de dépistage, gardez à l'esprit que plus le nombre de personnes avec qui vous avez eu des contacts est faible, plus, plus les autorités de santé publique seront en mesure de rechercher tous les contacts rapidement et facilement, ce qui leur permettra de briser les chaînes de transmission et d'assurer la maîtrise de la propagation de COVID-19. Merci. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. New. We will now open the telephone line to question. For those who wish to ask a question, please press star one on your phone. Vous pouvez poser vos questions dans l'une des deux langues officielles. Uh, for those asking a question in the room, we ask that you make your uh, way over to the freestanding mic. We can start in uh, the room. First question. Uh, hi, Stephanie Levitz, the Canadian Press. Thank you, Dr. New, for taking the question. Um, I wanted to, to canvass your thoughts on this ongoing debate about the full-time return to school for kids. There, there just seems to be a lot of conflicting approaches being relayed out by the provinces, conflicting ideas about what is safe or what isn't safe for kids, and also this tension between the mental and sort of, I guess, growth, emotional or otherwise, of children versus the potential health risk. And so I wonder how you would counsel people to take that all into in, into effect as they're considering, one, how school boards are putting together these plans, and two, what parents are thinking they ought to be doing. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it is a difficult issue, and as uh, I think uh, uh, many scientists and public health authorities around the world, obviously including uh, uh, ourselves here in Canada, uh, we're constantly looking at uh, what the science shows us, what the evidence of a, an experience in other countries uh, has indicated uh, uh, may uh, sort of lead us towards uh, what might be the best possible path in terms of, uh, in this case, opening schools. Uh, uh, from the science, what we know is that certainly young people, children, uh, are, are less likely to have more severe consequences uh, if they do uh, get infected with, uh, with, uh, with the virus. Uh, the other part also, which is uh, still, I think, in, in play in terms of uh, gathering evidence, is that it also appears that in terms of transmission, uh, young children, at least in some of the studies I've seen, do not appear to be uh, as uh, efficient or effective in terms of transmitting uh, uh, the virus to others. And therefore, that is, I think, at the heart of the debate. Uh, what is the uh, sort of the, the risk tolerance, if you want to call it, in terms of also risk management uh, for school boards uh, uh, at the local level, but also for parents in terms of, quote, letting their kids go back to school uh, full time? Uh, as we've also indicated uh, numerous times, there are also many other what we call in um, sort of unanticipated consequences. And we know that uh, for, for kids, going to school is, uh, is very, very important for their growth and development beyond just, quote, academic sort of uh, uh, acquiring of knowledge uh, in terms of socialization, uh, uh, et, et cetera. We, we recognize their mental health impacts that uh, are also uh, uh, in play. And so uh, uh, certainly we've learned uh, quite a bit, uh, and we're actually at the present time still looking at what the experience has been in some of those provinces, I think notably British Columbia and Quebec, that, that did open their, their schools to a certain degree, uh, sort of in late spring, early summer. Uh, and certainly uh, we'll take a careful look at that. And that would, I think, uh, give us uh, further um, evidence and data that might help inform uh, provinces and local sport, school boards across the country in terms of uh, what uh, they may wish to decide uh, uh, for, for this coming fall. Uh, one of the other things that we certainly were very uh, uh, cognizant of is that, uh, you know, there, there's different types of, uh, um, sort of um, proposals being put forward. For example, uh, do all kids just go to school full time or do we stagger classes, have maybe uh, half the kids go one day and half the other? Uh, we recognize that uh, anything other than full time attendance has implications even for the parents, especially if they're working. And so all these uh, factors have to be taken into account. Uh, I, I think at this time there's no easy answer. 
uh, but certainly uh, based on what uh, Quebec and, and British Columbia experienced, and certainly from what I've seen, it's been a positive experience uh, for all concerned. Uh, the question now is whether they, quote, ramp it up and then sort of more fully open the school boards, uh, uh, schools, uh, classes to kids in the fall. I think uh, bottom line is that uh, in some ways it is a bit of a social experiment and, and people need to appreciate that it is a bit of a, a risk management and risk tolerance. And, and certainly my understanding is that at the local level, um, uh, certainly there, I think there would be a, probably an option for parents uh, in terms of a uh, uh, having their kids go to school, but uh, I think uh, the final decision, I think, is, is best left to local school boards. As, as well, uh, the other part we've always talked about is that uh, it also depends on what the local epidemiology is. Uh, certainly how much virus is circulate, circulating in the community may also ha play a factor in terms of how uh, a local school, school board may uh, decide in terms of uh, uh, to what degree they open up uh, classes for all kids. Thank you, follow-up. Um, I want to ask a follow-up based on now we have mandatory mask requirements going in place in a number of cities. Uh, Ottawa is now one. I, I wonder if you could reflect on what public health has learned in the past when you've asked people to take a mandatory health action and how challenging it can be sometimes to make them do it. <laughs> and I'm thinking of, you know, safe sex education would be an example, vaccination would be an example, and whether to what extent um, at the federal level you're considering any kind of campaign to try and encourage this and what that might look like given your prior experience. Thank you very much for the question. It's, it's a tough one. I think uh, from a sort of a health promotion perspective, those of us who work in public health uh, recognize that uh, there's, there are many types of what we call healthy behaviors, uh, activities that uh, we would like people to, to undertake, uh, but we recognize that uh, uh, based on the number of factors, uh, maybe at a population level, but also uh, individually, uh, those, those are the things that uh, we need to examine as to why people may be hesitant in, in some ways to take up a certain behavior that certainly, based on the science and evidence, uh, we in public health would think would be a good thing to do. Uh, as you mentioned, a vaccination, uh, certainly uh, from a public health perspective, I'm a, I'm a strong advocate uh, for a vaccination. It's certainly uh, been shown to be one of the most effective uh, public health tools in terms of uh, eliminating what we call uh, vaccine-preventable diseases. But for some reason, in, in certain uh, communities or certain uh, groups of individuals, uh, there's a hesitancy. And so uh, I think in many ways, uh, uh, doing more behavioral uh, research, uh, we're doing uh, that uh, across the country, will give us clues as to what might be the underlying factors that we need to address to, uh, uh, at the end of the day, hopefully, uh, uh, increase uptake of, of vaccination. We recognize that it might be a, a lack of uh, maybe a certain information, but there are other factors in play as well. Uh, with respect to the mask, there, therefore, I would say that, uh, as we've mentioned before, uh, Dr. Tam, myself, and I think other public health authorities across the country, uh, certainly from the evidence that we've seen so far, uh, as a sort of a, as a population health measure, it's a simple, effective uh, measure. It doesn't cost very much. And I think uh, certainly uh, the evidence from uh, uh, around the world shows that uh, it has been shown to decrease the overall transmission of the virus. So it makes sense. Uh, but uh, we also recognize there are cultural factors involved. Uh, uh, as uh, we've noted uh, historically, in, uh, let's say, countries in the Far East, uh, maybe culturally it's been much more accepted, or at least earlier compared to maybe... Uh, uh, Western countries, in terms of uh, mask wearing, anytime you're sick, it shows, I think, also uh, uh, maybe it's a sign of respect to others that you would wear a mask in public. In, in, uh, in North America, I think uh, it's actually been quite amazing uh, with, I think, the information and, and people becoming aware of the benefits. Uh, the uptake and the change, I think, in the attitudes in terms of ma uh, mask wearing uh, have been nothing uh, short of incredible in the, in the course of a, a few short months. Uh, however, I think um, what also needs to be taken into account is that there are many sort of tools in the toolbox, and certainly uh, uh, health promotion, as you mentioned, maybe uh, advertising campaigns, uh, increasing awareness is, is certainly, I think, uh, ideal in terms of getting uh, the general public to take up what we call healthy behaviors or, or uh, activities. Uh, and, but uh, the use of what we call regulations or more of a regulatory approach is certainly a, sort of a, usually a something of a last resort uh, that we would uh, uh, want to undertake. And so I think we're still focusing on the, the education and, and hopefully uh, people understanding the benefits to themselves and others to uh, uh, to wear uh, maybe uh, face masks in public, especially uh, uh, you know in, in situations where they can't maintain that physical distancing of two meters. 
But at some point, uh, depending on uh, local circumstances, and again, uh, it's the epidemiology that drives it, uh, I can certainly understand why local officials might uh, want to make it, uh, how you say, mandatory. Especially, I think, in large cities, uh, where there is, uh, let's say, a circulating virus in the activity, uh, uh, and it's a much uh, higher population density, uh, it may make more sense to maybe have that type of a regulatory approach as opposed to maybe, let's say, up north in the territories where there's much more wide open spaces. The other example I would also point to in the past, it's interesting, and I think people now take it for granted, is that when people first talked about uh, car seatbelt use, you know, at the beginning we talked about education and saying it's, it saves lives, you automatically put on a, a car seatbelt and when you, when you go for a drive, uh, successful at a certain point, and then certainly I think uh, looking at the risks and benefits, I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, finally, I think uh, what's been done across the board is, quote, the regulatory approach. So that's just another example of another, quote, healthy behavior uh, that can save lives that at the end of the day, based on the, uh, the uptake and then other factors, that's the way it, it went for seatbelts. Uh, can't say that's the way it's going to go for face masks, but those are certainly some of the considerations in play. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, CTV. Hi, Dr. Molly Thomas, CTV National News. Um, you mentioned that outbreaks are linked to social gatherings, so funerals or, um, you know, family gatherings. I think about here in Ontario, you know, is our 10-person bubble too big when we look at, you know, messing with those numbers that seem to have held really quite well over the last month since your last projections? Thank you. It's a good question. I don't think it's a matter of numbers or how many people are in your bubble. I think it's still a matter of people understanding and uh, continuing to be, how we, how we call it, uh, sort of uh, vigilant and, and uh, disciplined, I guess is the word, in terms of uh, uh, undertaking all of the, the, the standard and proven public health measures. So I know we keep repeating, you know, the physical distancing, uh, the good hand hygiene, uh, staying home if you're sick, uh, and certainly uh, uh, wearing a, a, a mask or face covering uh, in situations where you might not be able to maintain that two-meter distance. So I don't think it's a matter necessarily of numbers, but I think uh, I think with the warm weather, uh, uh, businesses starting to open up, uh, people, uh, I think, uh, going a bit cabin crazy maybe after the long winter we've had, that uh, people, I think, uh, uh, assuming human nature, th some things I think are, are forgetting and that's why I think it might be driving some of these local outbreaks. So I think we need to keep uh, underlining the key public health messages and uh, telling people that, no, it's not over. And if uh, uh, there's too much of what we call a relapse in terms of those good uh, public health measures, then certainly we'll see more and more of these outbreaks. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that, you know, that rapid case detection and quarantine has to be a part of it. Um, you said that some other countries are doing this well. Who is doing it well? Who is Canada watching? And what can we learn from them? Uh, certainly, uh, countries that come to mind uh, include South Korea, and I think uh, uh, they did an excellent job at the beginning, obviously, in terms of flattening their curve. And then uh, recently, with uh, uh, uptick in cases, I think it's also part of the, I think, the acceptance of the culture there. My understanding is that uh, when there were a few, uh, a few cases detected in nightclubs and, uh, uh, and so forth, the fact that uh, I think it was, a, a, I think, either procedure or protocol, whatever you want to call it, that in the nightclubs, if you entered the nightclub, you had to give all of your contact information uh, upon entry. And that enabled the, the local authorities to be able to rapidly sort of contact the individuals who might have been exposed and obviously counsel them to go get testing. So I think uh, those are the kinds of things that we're looking for uh, uh, in terms of uh, best, uh, best practices that we might apply here in Canada. I think overall... I think uh, we've done an excellent job because we're now in a place in Canada that uh, most of the cases that uh, we're finding are actually uh, uh, linked to a known source. So I think in terms of a classic public health practice, uh, local health authorities are able to quote, get on top of cases, do the, the contact tracing, making sure that the, obviously the index case uh, is isolated and, and uh, managed well, but also that all of the contact, uh, contacts are, are found and also counseled, uh, put in quarantine, et cetera, and making sure that they're monitored uh, for symptoms as well. Go about for it. masks. So now that, you know, indoor spaces are different for us. So if I'm, you know, going to have lunch today, should I be carrying three cloth masks in my uh, purse? I mean, should do I have to take it off and then that mask is put into a sealed bag and that's it? Or can I keep putting it on um, throughout? I mean, how does that work now in terms of not spreading any more of this if, if potentially I had it? Okay, well, I, I can't give you sort of all of the uh, sort of <laughs> possibilities of uh, how you could or should be using uh, 
face masks in public, I, I would say that uh, the one thing that we've always been uh, very aware of in public health is that uh, we don't want uh, the, uh, the use of face masks in public to sort of give that false sense of security. So that uh, if individuals wear face masks, oh, we don't have to worry about physical distancing, uh, good hand hygiene. And the other also uh, uh, big concern is that uh, by wearing a face mask, it's, it's uh, sometimes what, uh, what people don't realize is that then they start fiddling with the mask and touching their face and so on. That, that obviously then, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, puts themselves at risk, obviously, in terms of contamination. So I think the, the most important thing is that there's lots of, I think, videos online, et cetera, in terms of good, I think, uh, face mask etiquette in terms of how you should appropriately uh, put on your, your face mask and not fiddle with it and maybe adjust uh, sort of the nose piece. And then afterwards, I think if you do take it off, let's say if you go for lunch, I think uh, if you put it in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a bag or a place that you know that uh, is also, I say, clean, uh, and then also uh, maybe use a good hand sanitizer, uh, et cetera. After uh, your lunch, I think it would be fine to take that mask gig and put it on. Usually, I think if it's a good cloth mask, I think uh, uh, using good practices, I think it, it would be good for the day. Uh, if you do happen to have two or three, then, and that's fine, you could all obviously use that, but uh, I don't think uh, we need to uh, make f uh, people feel guilty that if they only have the one that, you know, that they're, they're not uh, doing the right thing by using that one uh, mask appropriately throughout the day. And then as they say at the end of the day, uh, I think appropriately washing it and uh, hopefully maybe having uh, another one for the, for the next day is uh, what you should do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. New. We will now turn to the phone operator. Thank you. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. Veuillez, s'il vous plaît, appuyer sur étoile 1 pour poser une question. La première question est de Vincent Maisonneuve de Radio-Canada. À vous la parole. Bonjour, merci beaucoup. Euh, euh, J'aurais une question à vous poser sur... Euh, bon, à, la Ville de Montréal a décidé de rendre le port du masque obligatoire à l'intérieur dans les lieux publics. Euh, avec les données que vous avez sur la situation au Québec, est-ce que vous croyez que... Plus de villes québécoises autour de la région de Montréal ou dans l'ensemble de la province devraient adopter des règlements pour rendre le port du masque obligatoire à l'intérieur dans les lieux publics. Oui, merci pour la question. Comme j'ai déjà um, expliqué en anglais, que le, le port d'un masque, c'est une autre mesure supplémentaire de santé publique pour se protéger ou aussi peut-être protéger les autres uh, contre l'exposition. Uh, Uh, du virus, mais uh, c'est intéressant pour moi, c'est uh, un comportement que si on donne assez de, de, de l'information, des renseignements, on, 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 on toujours on encourage uh, les, les personnes, uh, si on sort de la maison, uh, si on uh, peut-être uh, on rentre dans les circonstances où c'est difficile de garder une distance de... Uh, Uh, distanciation physique de 2 mètres, oui, c'est une bonne idée de porter un masque. Uh, la question de, de, de rendre le, le port d'un masque obligatoire, c'est toujours, une, comme on dit, une option, un outil uh, pour les, les autorités à, à l'échelle locale. Mais uh, uh, c'est quelque chose, uh, vraiment, je pense que uh, c'est uh, une décision uh, pour les autorités en considérant le contexte et aussi um, uh, l'épidémiologie à l'échelle locale. Uh, je pense dans une grande ville comme Montréal où uh, il y a encore uh, l'activité avec le virus et aussi uh, la, on va dire, la densité de la population uh, plus haut peut-être uh, comparé à la campagne. Uh, je, je parle toujours de lac saint jean où uh, ma, belle, ma belle famille <rire> est, uh, est située. Uh, les, les décisions à l'échelle locale, je pense, uh, uh, doivent être différentes. Uh, pour moi... C'est aussi important pour le, le grand public de, de savoir qu'il y a vraiment... En anglais, on parle toujours de, de « three C's », mais je pense que ça, ça, ça peut aussi uh, être important en français. Je pense que je peux utiliser l'acronyme BEC, uh, BEC uh, B, pour uh, uh, peut-être éviter les, les endroits bondés, un rassemblement avec beaucoup de personnes. Eux, pour uh, contact étroit, il faut toujours uh, uh, essayer d'éviter un contact étroit. Et c'est aussi les espaces clos. So, ça, ça c'est des, des principes importants. Et ici, euh, c'est un autre euh, outil euh, à l'échelle locale pour euh, les autorités, euh, pour aussi euh, euh, diminuer le risque à l'échelle de la population. Euh, oui, euh, je suis d'accord. Ce n'est pas pour moi pour euh, dire exactement c'est quoi les critères pour euh, les autres euh, villes et régions autour de Montréal. Je pense que c'est vraiment une décision euh, en considérant tous les facteurs pour les autorités euh, à l'échelle euh, locale. Merci. 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 Est-ce qu'il y a une question suivie, Vincent? 
Non, ça va, merci. Parfait, merci. Prochaine question, opérateur. Merci. The next question is from Vic Adapia from CBC News Health Unit. Please go ahead. Hi there, Dr. New. Uh, by now, I'm wondering if you had seen the letter uh, signed by various uh, public, former public health uh, doctors in which they uh, call for a more balanced approach in dealing with COVID-19 because the overall, in their words, um, aim to contain uh, COVID-19 is having uh, um, increasing inequities across the country and uh, feel that uh, that provinces and the federal government are taking the wrong approach in, in trying to control the outbreak. Just wondering what your response is to that, if any. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I've seen that that open letter, and uh, I, I'm not sure if I agree entirely with uh, the way you're, you're reading it. Uh, certainly the issues that, that were raised in the letter are, are, are certainly uh, issues that have been recognized uh, on a consistent basis uh, by those of us in public health here working in the federal government, as well as provinces and territories. Uh, uh, certainly, I think Dr. Tam, myself, at our multiple uh, press conferences have talked about uh, uh, the fact that there are certain uh, populations, uh, vulnerable populations, uh, including uh, racialized Canadians, uh, uh, individuals in sort of a poor socioeconomic uh, status situations that are more at risk of uh, uh, being exposed to the virus and having also a, a more adverse outcomes, as well as, uh, you know, uh, looking at uh, uh, some of the what we call unintended consequences, you know, the fact that uh, there's been a surgeries postponed, uh, other uh, 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 chronic diseases, infectious diseases, uh, certainly the, the care and treatment uh, uh, has, has suffered because of uh, uh, the focus on COVID-19. So that's been well recognized. And uh, behind the scenes, uh, certainly we've uh, worked uh, tirelessly uh, with our, our, our counterparts in public health and provinces and territories to uh, both at a strategic level and also I think at a very uh, sort of operational and programmatic uh, uh, level, uh, uh, look at activities to, to actually address that. Uh, one of the issues that has come up, and I think uh, getting to, to the point of inequities, is that we recognize that you don't know how, quote, maybe, quote, that the, how um, severe a situation is if you don't have good data. So the, the whole issue of uh, getting better data in terms of race and ethnicity uh, has come up, and we certainly recognize that. Uh, I'm not saying it's being solved overnight, but certainly we've made uh, good progress in uh, working with our counterparts in the provinces and territories. Uh, people recognize that uh, we need that kind of data to maybe establish, quote, a baseline. And then as we uh, move forward in terms of addressing uh, those issues, let's say, uh, be it inequities, that hopefully then we'll also have the data to later show, uh, uh, evaluate that, that we are making progress and uh, uh, dealing with that. So I think uh, overall, uh, uh, what's in the letter by uh, many of these people who are former colleagues of mine, I, I, would, I wouldn't disagree. I think, uh, uh, they, I think uh, they've uh, re uh, sort of uh, uh, so underlined or, or, or put again into focus uh, the issues that we've always recognized and uh, we're continuing to work on them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, follow up question, Vic? Uh, no, that's fine. I, I, I mean, the one thing that it just strikes me, looking at the projections for the fall, um, where, you know, we have the potential of, of four times as many cases as we did in April, um, they, they use the language risk-based. Um, I mean, what's your response to that? Because they seem to be suggesting that it isn't necessarily the same risk-based, but, but rather too sweeping in the uh, attempts to control the outbreak. Um, no, okay. So risk based, I think. Uh, I think we're, we're. I think talking the same language, and I think uh, we're seeing it play out even now. Uh, as uh, uh, we've successfully, I think, you know, uh, you know, quote, flattened the curve here in Canada. Uh, certainly, uh, one of the big fears uh, in in the spring uh, uh, was that uh, we would overload or sort of uh, overwhelm our healthcare system in terms of uh, having cases that uh, needed to uh, be in the ICUs, and that certainly hasn't happened. So I think again. Uh, I think a uh, 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 big kudos to uh, everyone involved, all Canadians, the sacrifices that have been made to uh, uh, make sure that uh, we didn't uh, uh, have uh, that many infections that obviously uh, uh, had uh, severe consequences as well. And so now we're in the place in terms of this transition where we're now looking at, quote, slowly opening up uh, uh, the, the economy sectors. Uh, and as you, as you also pointed out, uh, in a sort of a, a risk-based approach. So looking at the epidemiology, I think uh, we're now in, in, in the world of what we call 
uh, risk management and risk tolerance. Uh, and I think, uh, without getting too many, uh, too many details here, I think uh, what uh, public health authorities and governments across the country are, are now recognizing is that there is this balance be between uh, sort of uh, focusing uh, uh, solely on COVID-19, but also recognizing, as I just mentioned earlier, about unintended consequences and the fact you have to have this balance. Uh, the fact is the virus will be uh, around for some time. Uh, we don't have a vaccine or, or effective treatment at the present time, so we only have the, uh, uh, the measures of you know, physical distancing, good hand hygiene, uh, staying home if you're sick, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so how do we manage moving forward uh, with a risk-based approach that will still uh, open up the economy, but then also keep the activity of the virus at, quote, a manageable level. So I think uh, what we're also talking about is that we will, I think in general, accept a certain level of activity and recognize that we will have cases coming, uh, uh, coming uh, forward, but that there will not be an overwhelming uh, outbreak and we'll be able to manage it within the healthcare system and also with public health in terms of the contact tracing and so on. And that's the, the, the way we need to go forward. Uh, uh, while also obviously uh, uh, having a, a less of an impact uh, on all of those other uh, uh, things that we've talked about, you know, the other uh, infectious chronic diseases uh, uh, and other parts of uh, a society that obviously uh, we need to also, uh, uh, as they say, open up so that they also uh, uh, are, are, are also able to get back to uh, closer to what was uh, the normal before, but we also, also recognize it won't be uh, the same normal moving forward. And then hopefully... Uh, in let's say uh, you know several months or a year or so, we'll have those effective treatments and vaccines, and then we can uh, adjust our response to moving forward from there. Merci, Dr. New. Une dernière question, opérateur. Merci. La prochaine question est de Sébastien C. François de Radio Canada. À vous la parole. Bonjour, Monsieur New. Euh, question en français. Euh, J'aimerais savoir comprendre le message principal aujourd'hui. Est-ce que c'est que ça va bien? Est-ce que c'est qu'il faut qu'on reste vraiment euh, très attentif aux mesures de distanciation sociale? C'est quoi votre message principal aujourd'hui, M. Nou? Je pense que euh, le message principal, c'est que oui, ça va bien au Canada, mais il ne faut pas lâcher euh, tous tout, euh, nos efforts euh, Uh, uh, nos, nos bons efforts uh, uh, pour uh, continuer à uh, uh, diminuer la, 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 comme dit, la, la propagation uh, du virus. Donc, uh, avec l'été, uh, uh, tout le monde uh, a hâte de, de sortir dehors. C'est sûr qu'on va avoir plus de contacts de chaque personne qui sort uh, au lieu de rester à la maison. C'est sûr qu'on va avoir beaucoup plus de contacts uh, qu'avant, mais c'est très important de continuer de, 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 de pratiquer les, les, les bonnes mesures de santé public éprouvé, euh, garder la distanciation physique, euh, bonne hygiène euh, avec euh, lavage des mains, aussi euh, le porte de masque ici, on n'est pas capable de garder une distanciation physique de 2 mètres. So, donc, euh, le message, c'est oui, c'est encourageant, on a bien fait, mais il faut continuer à être, comme on dit, prudent avec, euh, avec nos activités. Question suivie, Sébastien? Oui, s'il vous plaît, merci. <coughs> Monsieur Nou, euh... Uh, how much of a game changer is the recognition by the WHO that this could be airborne? Uh, à quel point uh, ça change la donne pour vous que l'OMS et que les preuves uh, scientifiques démontrent que ce virus-là, c'est pas seulement la transmission par les gouttelettes, uh, par exemple des gens qui parlent ou des gens qui toussent, mais que ça peut être aussi airborne, donc juste avec la respiration. À quel point ça change la donne pour vous? Je vais répondre en anglais, c'est plus facile. Uh, uh, your question about uh, the WHO and this uh, so-called game changer, I would disagree. I don't think it's a game changer. Uh, I think I have a couple of observations before I answer your ca question directly. Uh, certainly, we've learned a lot about this virus. I think uh, the scientific and public health community around the world have done amazing work. Uh, the virus has only been around for, uh, you know, about seven months. And uh, 
uh, the amount of uh, knowledge we've gained uh, about uh, things like transmission dynamics, uh, what the effects are on the human body, uh, et cetera, and so on, I, I think have been nothing short of amazing. Um, so that's one observation. Uh, the, 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 what also happens is that, is that when science advances, it's always incremental. And uh, what I think is different in this case is that uh, normally when there's good scientific debate, uh, it's sort of like insider baseball. The scientists, you know, have good uh, sort of uh, debate uh, discussions among themselves. But in this case, it's happening out in the public eye. So I think that that's one thing that, that's different. Uh, the other, other part also is that with, uh, I think, the tremendous sort of interest and be it pressure uh, on, on scientists, et cetera, that come up with, you know, uh, new information, uh, evidence about the virus. Uh, one of the things I've also noticed that uh, uh, in terms of uh, doing studies and, and, and publication, uh, the way it's, it's normally been done is that scientists uh, uh, submit uh, the, the results of a research uh, study uh, uh, through what we call a, a peer review process in terms of a scientific publication. You know, it goes there to uh, several peers. They, they analyze, analyze it, criticize it, look at the, uh, the methodology, et cetera, before it finally gets a sort of a, uh, fine-tune and then put in a public, uh, uh, the public domain, I would say, in a scientific publication. What we've also seen sometimes now is that uh, sometimes uh, what happens is that the science is now sort of being put on the public uh, uh, through a, what we call a press release. And so the scientists, including myself, we don't have much to go on. It's out there in public, and we're asked to react to it, but it's just as a quoted press release. We don't have the actual substantive scientific publication with all of the nitty-gritty details, the data, the, the methods, et cetera, to actually uh, take a close, hard look at. So, so that, that's one thing. The issue of the, 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 the transmission and, and droplets and so on is not new. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, what I think has been recognized by do those of us in the scientific public health community for quite some time. So I'm going to try and uh, explain it as much as I can in, uh, in sort of uh, terms that uh, I think hopefully most of the general public can, can appreciate. So first of all, we recognize that this virus uh, is the same as many other uh, respiratory infections. And the main mode of transmission is that when people you know, cough or talk or sing, uh, droplets are transmitted into the air. And uh, most of these droplets are quite large uh, and have a lot of virus, but they usually fall to the ground uh, within a sort of a, a few feet, or in, in most cases, certainly within two meters of, the, of, of an individual who coughs uh, or sings or talks, uh, who has, has a COVID-19 infection. However, it's, it's certainly uh, uh, true, and, and, and the science has shown, that uh, there are smaller droplets, and so it's more of a gradient, not sort of a, a black and white, oh, there's large droplets, and then there's something called airborne, and I'll get to airborne in a second. But there are also these very small droplets that some of them uh, also will fall to the ground within a certain distance, uh, uh, probably a greater distance than the larger droplets. And there are others that what might, uh, what we call in terms of infection prevention control, aerosols. And those also, I think, uh, uh, have, a, have a certain uh, sort of a meaning within the uh, infectious disease uh, prevention control world. What I think is, is a bit misleading, I think, for the general public is that the word airborne means certain things to maybe the general public. Oh, it's somewhere in the air. But uh, for those of us uh, working in, in sort of medicine and public health, airborne has a very specific meaning. An airborne disease is usually a very infectious disease in which, quote, uh, the particles or the virus, in, in this case, uh, can linger in the air for several hours and days, and then uh, people can become infected. Uh, let's say if, let's say, someone who actually had the virus uh, and the disease left the room and several hours later, someone also came into that room and then uh, uh, breathed in the same air, they could also get infected. From the evidence, what we've seen from the epidemiology and so, and so on, uh, to this point, there's no evidence that COVID-19 is airborne. The classic example of an airborne disease is measles. And uh, the, the, R, uh, sorry, the R0 for that, the reproductive number, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 18, which means that if uh, uh, someone has measles, on average, uh, they could be expected to infect up to about 18 or so people. That hasn't proven to be the case in terms of COVID-19. Uh, influenza has an R0 of about 1, 2, or somewhere in that range, depending on specific situations. Uh, the early evidence for um, uh, COVID-19, I, I saw an R0 of uh, somewhere about 2. I think based on more evidence and, uh, 
and the epidemiology as it's evolved around the world, I would say it's probably now maybe three, four, maybe in the range of five, but it's certainly not in the range of uh, measles and 18. So uh, let's be clear, the evidence so far has not shown it to be airborne in that classic definition uh, sense uh, as measles. And certainly uh, based on what we've done so far in terms of the public health measures, they've been proven effective. We've done a good job in Canada in terms of uh, decreasing in transmission with all of the measures we've put in place, the physical distancing, the good hand hygiene, the mask wearing, and that's all been consistent with uh, what we understand about how the COVID-19 is transmitted, primarily by close contact and droplets. And so uh, in English, uh, I, we've talked about the three Cs, avoid uh, indoor close spaces with bad ventilation, avoid, avoid crowded places, and avoid, clo avoid uh, close contact. And by doing all those things, uh, certainly based on the epidemiology and the way uh, the COVID-19 uh, has, has uh, sort of a um, uh, sort of uh, manifested itself. Uh, uh, certainly, we're, we're quite comfortable with uh, the measures we put in place and continuing with that. Merci beaucoup, Dr. New. C'est ce qui met fin à la conférence de presse pour aujourd'hui.